Hey guys, welcome to Jiu-Jitsu Motivation Podcast. My name is Greg Melita, Black Belt Second Degree, owner of Hamptons Jiu-Jitsu. And I'm Brian DeLuca, Black Belt and author of Jiu-Jitsu for Small People and Other Weird Shit I Think About. <laughs> Today we have an awesome guest, Christopher Howder, on and I uh, want to welcome him on. He's been a huge inspiration for us here at Jiu-Jitsu Motivation, one of the uh, original American Black Belts in the art. So many years of experience in the, uh, in the style and... Uh, just amazing to have him on today. So, Chris, welcome to the show. Thanks, guys. So, yeah, uh, let's start off with just a little bit of that exact history. You're one of the original American black belts. How'd that come about? How'd you start? And then how'd that all go? Well, um, I'm going to give you the, 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 the most brief answer that I possibly can. And partially because it has been said which I don't think is entirely true, but it's partially true, that every time you repeat a story of a memory, what you're starting to remember is the story of remembering of remembering the story. And because I'm actually working on this giant graphic novel project with one of my black belts, Sam Crescent, um, I don't want to repeat my origin uh, story a lot, but it's basically the same ubiquitous cliche origin uh, story we all hear is I grew up an insecure, stuttering a kid who had a strong will and wouldn't say no but to altercations. And you either learn through the hard way or you get smart. And I had to learn almost every lesson the hard way. So when I finally found the jujitsu, I found that yin and yang, a contrast between basically a group of alpha men with very hard stubbornness and all, all that stuff all into one, Yet the other side was this flowing, almost Aikido-like in spirit approach to reality hand-to-hand -hand combat. And it was that contrast that is so appealing to the guys like me. And so in short, I stumbled into the jujitsu. And unlike a lot of guys, I was convinced very quickly that, yes, this is what I want to learn. I'm not here to challenge it. I'm not here to find what martial art will beat it. I'm all in. And I'll just say this. It's like I knew I had hit the gold mine of martial arts. I'd been training and practicing martial arts in some, e either a formal Kung Fu karate class with JKD at the Inosano Academy, a professional Muay Thai fight. I had been pursuing this kind of hodgepodge find what works in the reality of real fights for a while when I'd stumbled on this and was instantly, because I'm a natural grappler, I'm a primate, I'm a grabber. And although I love the stand up arts and all that stuff, and I still appreciate them, boxing does not love me back. And grappling is truly the easier, softer way, even in the more harder, explosive, athletic styles of grappling, i.e. wrestling, the, the judo, the greco. Even those, I feel more comfortable when I am losing in a grappling altercation than when I'm winning in a, a striking altercation. Because I feel like I have more 
a control of my immediate environment. And one of the things that's a frequent uh, topic in military law enforcement and such is the mental aspects of security, right? And I also, I have to jump in here real quick because there's a tendency to whatever one does that that both consciously and subconsciously alters who you are. And when you spend your life worrying or thinking about violent personal altercations, it will affect who and what you think and how you see the world. And I think it's really important, and I've observed this over the last 20 years, but increasingly in the last three years, is that the paranoid mindset is not a good thing for civilization or democracy. And I have been canceled by a lot of uh, people because I'm probably one of the few guys that actually speaks out against what I see as national but tribalism. And I mean that on the right and on the left. And this, this dividing of us as if we are competing the jujitsu schools, that's fine and great when we're slapping hands and the referee blows the whistle and we're arguing over whether who scored what points or not. But that's not good when we're arguing over whether who won an election or not. And whether we can um, firebomb the Portland courthouse or not. And these are not good things. And our martial arts community, we are supposed to be, just like military and cops, the guardians of the rule of law, but the guardians of what's right and wrong. And clearly, within all of those things, we often fail. And the last thing we want to do is choose a team. And one of the most powerful things that happened in November was the release of a bunch of generals, admirals, high command that said, we are not going to choose a side. If there is polarization happening, that we will not choose a side. The military will not uh, but choose a side. Because that's how the countries fall. That's what's happening in Myanmar. That's what happened in Russia. How they had their brief flirt with a democracy and it was gone. And I will just say this and then I promise guys and you hearing the podcast... Most of you, if you're on a tribe, you probably already shut me off. But, but, this is important because with democracy, what it offers is hope. Because if you can have a a convincing argument, you can change the country. And I encourage anyone from either from any ideology to present convincing arguments to change the country through the process of a republic in which we exist. That gives you hope. That gives you hope that in the in three and a half years you get to change what you don't like. And as soon as you take that away you have fallen into fascism. And with that, let's talk about the (laughs) jujitsu. So, so that was pretty, pretty deep, Chris, right? Pretty deep, but let's bring it back to where we were talking about like jujitsu schools versus the individuals, right? 
So you have. You, want, you, know, you can uh -huh. erase all that and, and no, you know, no. edit this. No, that's, no, that's no, perfect. No, absolutely not. Absolutely that is not. perfect. <laughs> We we are keeping that. That was awesome. Yes. So so jujitsu schools versus the individuals, right? We we tend to all get caught up in our school or ranks versus actually our accomplishments, right? So how do you sort of take what you were saying there and sort of you know bring that back to jujitsu and the schools and the pieces for for schools and individuals versus you know their success? So. But jiu-jitsu, boxing, the, the, the combat sports are all individual one-on-one -on -one sports. Mm -hmm. And anyone probably hearing this found at one point in their life that they loved that aspect. And let's uh, contrast that with the NFL, basketball. These are team sports in which you are absolutely subconsciously and consciously aware at all times that you are relying on your teammates. And that creates what I'm going to call a more a collective mindset, which is also good. In the combat sports, it's one-on-one. -on -one. When you step out on the mat, your coach cannot help you Put the arm bar on. It's all you. When they close the cage door, whatever it is, when the whistle blows and the ref says go, it's you against one opponent, which is the purest form of individualism. And the jujitsu, Later, we realize that we need a team and we need others in order to create the powerful individual within you, right? And then when you start to appreciate those guys who you came up in the ranks with, with the guy who was just under you, the guy who's even, and the guy who's just ahead. And any but given night or week or role, the, the, those shift. It's like he caught me or I caught him. I finally caught him. Or, oh, that guy finally caught me in that. And that is that competitive beauty of climbing the ladder in this thing. And, and, and that environment is a wonderful environment. And we know that it needs a team. And I've often said in this that you could basically have as, as a school, and I don't have a school which allows me to be an observer from the outside. Although I lack the experience of running a school week in, week out, all that kind of stuff, I sure have gone to all kinds of schools and I've seen good chemistry and I've seen bad chemistry. I've seen excellent student body groups with poor leadership and I've seen great leadership with a few poisonous members in the student body. And I've, and I've seen how location is important and yet not important. Unlike if you want to open up a, a gas a station, you critically have to open it up on the corner that people can conveniently stop through. Whereas a, a jiu-jitsu school, not so much. And, and so what was the question again? Because boy, did I... <laughs> no, 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 you were, you were getting there, man. You were getting there. So the question Real was... Uh, at any time. No, I'm really in, I'm really in. So the question was, you know, the sort of, you know, we, we go through these schools, we have these belt ranks and there's these systems of, of getting there, right? So you're, you know, white, blue, purple, brown, black, right? Versus your individual accomplishments. Because, you know, like you said, there may be someone who's slightly below you who could catch you, you know? So what, you know, what's your view on that? Like, you know, how do you see that? Well... <sighs> When I was new in this, it was either said or frequently implied that not everybody gets but to be a black belt. That it's not the time and grade. 
I don't care if you're in this for 20 years. If you're not holding your own against the black belts, you will never be a black belt. And of course, when we start to analyze this through the lens of science, it becomes a bit more uh, complex because how do we control these in environments? And, and you also have to think about all a pre-internet days and schools, each school was definitely more, more, um, you know, let, let me just rewind here a minute and say one of the analogies that I love the most that I use all the time for but, but, but jujitsu is the analogy of a language. You are learning a language. You, you are learning the language of grappling. And let's call it the Latin languages. And there's Latin, there's Italian, there's French, there's Spanish. And you are learning when you are at an individual school and communicating within that a group. You're not only learning a language, but you're learning an accent, a colloquialism. You're learning more than just the structure of words. And you could have a school where you're learning a lot of slang. And other schools may say, that's not the proper language. That's not the Queen's English. And is that bad or not? Be because language, like everything, evolves. If you transported yourself, any of us, right now back to the 1200s England, London, we would not understand a word they are saying, nor would they understand us. And even if we went back but the to 1800s Alabama, we might understand a lot of the words and they understand us, but we would miss all kinds of slang, colloquialisms, and all that stuff. So, there is an argument for preserving an original language and history. And there's also an argument for letting language and history continue and evolve. And I don't choose a side in this. It's like people think, are, are, are you a classical original jitsu guy or are you a modern new school guy right i don't choose a side i don't choose a side with the u.s constitution i both see the value of a more rigid classical in interpretation and a more living breathing interpretation and this is i think where I have developed my approach to where I rank. And you are basically ranked within your peer group based on your personal potential of growth. If you are a wounded non-athlete, I am ranking you based upon my vision of where I see that you can achieve mastery yeah. and get the two a black belt and it's kind of like should this ever become an olympic sport there isn't going to be blue belt olympic world champions it's going to be black belt so ultimately all the belts are practice and training and just steps but delineating Making an imaginary line that says you are now closer to your black belt. And if I had a magic wand, I would not give the white the belt a blue belt. I would slowly make that white belt a little more blue until one day they looked up, up, down and became aware that it was blue. 
And in the olden days, there was not a test. One day, a belt was wrapped around you, or even in the locker room, or you won your comp and you're on the a podium and they walk up and wrap around your necks a belt. And I find that more organic and more pure and more holding true to one's personal growth than creating a structure and a test and a regulation, be it via a private organization, which a state, a whatever it is, now we're leaning into, I understand the intent of regulating it. I understand the anger that some feel when they're, oh, they're just handing out belts now like candy, right? And I would call them for years, I would go, oh, that's a candy belt. Meaning they hosted some a prominent guy and because they hosted them, they got their belt. And ultimately none of that mattered unless you got your black belt as a candy belt. Ultimately, because, and lastly, and we'll skip on over the next question, is just remember somebody somewhere in the past, years ago, awarded themselves the first black belt. It's all man-made. It's all man-made well, culture. Yeah, I mean, that's 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 huge. I mean, you're, you're hitting on topics we were exactly looking to talk to you about. And going back to what you said about, you know, the, the tribalism in politics, be it left, right, and this and that, we're kind of seeing, like, and what I specifically wanted to ask you was we're kind of seeing that in jiu-jitsu now where it's like you got the, the classical old-school jiu-jitsu that wants nothing to do with anything new. You got the new school guys that are just doing their thing. But you're also seeing a lot of schools, you know, being defensive about the roots and then even – you know, like just doing promotions by your time in, you know, they, they give you uh, an invitation to then take a, a belt promotion test kind of a thing. You know, you're seeing a lot of different of these factions now where when I was coming up, it was, you know, assumed to me like it was more organic. And it was that was that's what was beautiful about jujitsu. Like you said, yes. like promote, promoting that guy on the podium. I do that. I did that with one of my guys. That was one of the best promoting experiences yeah. I've ever had to promote somebody. Because it you know feels what I mean? so because a podium a promotion is truly authentic. Right. Mm -hmm. You have you earned that spot on the podium. Therefore, it's like no shit. How many times are, will you be the blue belt world champion or the blue belt pan champion? It it can be absurd, right? And so, yeah, I don't know. And and um, some people are are often and people whom I very much respect are disgusted at the at the, um, what they call the taekwondoization of the jiu-jitsu, right? And I, I mean, back in the early days, there were uh, stripes on belts, not even the black belt at one point, right? And um, yeah, I mean, and uh, I used to joke when a, a blue belt would ask me her stripes, I would say, you can have nine of them if you want. You're still a blue belt. And the stripes, in my opinion, when used correctly, the stripes are really so the instructor can keep track of 300 guys and know that every six months you got to give stripes because then you know if that the blue belt who has 19 fucking stripes that either his game has to improve or I got to start watching him more. Something has to happen to get him to the next level. And, and that's the value of the stripe. And, and like everything, and again, I go back because it's yin yang. Everything has a bad and a good. Conservatism, liberalism, both have a good part and a bad part, right? And there's 
an aspect of it that is very good to have these markers to help us guide us along it's kind of a similar thing that happens in the military and very few people are going to spend 20 years in the say in listed ranks and make it to an e8 without at least acquiring the skills the leadership skills to be an e8 it's not automatic but because there's a structure you're not going to get there unless you're meeting various standards and that's the good part about it the bad part about it is we are creating a system now of regulation so, so then freedom is lost right and that's true with everything we humans do be it jujitsu organizations be it corporate workplaces be it mom and pops a store running their employees and, and that's yeah yeah, I mean, I think that's you hit that spot on again. And uh, I mean, me coming up, I always thought, um, you know, it, it was just beautiful. Like you said, the freedom of that, uh, you know, because I came from very traditional martial arts. Now seeing that that's kind of entering its way into jujitsu. But now, you know, when the black bar on the under belts, to me, that always represented you're seeking the black belt and you're on the journey. You know what I mean? Then you got the black belt. It always came with a red bar because you're that's like the next level of, you know, red belt mastery, that kind of thing. And it's just a place to put stripes. You know, now we're seeing a lot of different academies that, you know, they're, they're either charging for belt promotions, which I am very very against you know i'm more against the organic way uh like you like you said um but we're seeing that taekwondoing effect of jujitsu like you you were talking about you know um what's your thoughts on the belts and the meaning of like the, the red bar you're seeing a lot of like white bars on black belts now um and what's your opinions on charging for specifically for promotions well let's let's do a thought experiment <laughs> let's imagine that we still wore the gi but everybody just wore a white belt and that white belt was made of fine woven herring bone cotton woven in japan and that belt was something that you washed your gi, but you did not wash your belt. Eventually, that belt would become worn and brownish. And then that belt, when it was sufficiently worn and brown enough, we would sew on over that black cloth. And that would be the purest way to achieve the black belt. You wear out your white belt, you soil and you stain it with the tan particles off the old straw mats, the dust and dirt, no machine washing, the blood, the blood of your enemies <laughs> soil the blood of your enemies and then you seal that behind a black sewn on swath that is my ideal of the black belt now let's delve into another thought experiment that if that was the way it was would would that purify the whole ranking promotion thing. Would that eliminate all of the bullshit? I don't know if it would. I don't know if it would alter it. I don't know if it ultimately even matters. Let's say now we transport ourselves back into modern times. Let's say we transport us now 20 years. It's now 2028. I mean, 2058. And we're having virtual comps where there are 
but drones this large and they're flying around recording every match. You can watch for every 3D angle. You can put on probes and actually experience and feel the movement of each competitor. Would belts matter at all at that point? Because, but the belt ultimately is a separation from you, what's inside of your skull, to the exterior world. And when we run these experiments, the best that I get out of it, or any philosopher, is we're just jacking ourselves off, right, in these. But then when we return to reality, we get a new perspective of these belts. So when I award a stripe, I have now a new thing. I'm feeling what that feels like inside of the skull, not the exterior, the politics, the, all this stuff. I want my students to feel the internal experience of the jiu-jitsu, not the external trappings of being some kind of a rank or an entity. Um, I don't know if I've answered that. We beat the you know. question to death. Let's move on. <laughs> do, you, do you think the same thing happens with rule sets, right? That it sort of stifles the creativity in the arts, in the yes. art itself? It's the exact same thing with rules. Rules are all things that are wonderful ideas and can often be terrible implementations. Why should I have to drive 25 miles an hour at three o'clock in the morning when I can clearly see there are no other cars in any direction on the road? But the law says you can't because the law was created to work for a time when there's a bunch of cars and people all over. And it's the same thing why we create laws in the combat sports. We're creating these laws clearly for good reasons, ultimately, initially, to protect the athlete's health. Then it becomes to put butts in seats to make money by hosting competitions to fill the brackets or to fill the stadium. These become the higher rule then. It's no longer about the art or the athlete. It's about making money from the art and the athlete. Am I against that? No, that's entertainment. Let's put on a show. It's way more entertaining watching two unskilled guys slug it out with haymakers and wild shots than it is to watch two highly skilled grapplers battle over one grip for 15 minutes, 15 fucking minutes. And that's the other part of that, right? And so there's always layers in this, layers and layers and layers and layers. And if you're just looking down one layer, you're, you're, you will have an opinion on that one. And it could change when you change your view. And so, again, I, I'm not, I don't have an answer. My answer is always find more questions. So then how do you – okay, so – okay, on the philosophy realm, right, then how do you change your view? How should everyone go about changing their view of when they're set, you know, focused down one road? Environment is stronger than will. And if your environment shifts, eventually so too your mind will follow. You bring your ass so the mind will follow. You physically show up but to class every day. And after you show up, you suddenly have motivation. 
but you don't motivate yourself from the fucking couch. You just carry yourself from the couch to the car or to the mat. Then the motivation comes. And it's the same thing because I believe what we are speaking about is individual growth or evolution, which is one could parallel it to a cultural growth or evolution or actual biological growth and evolution. And it is a process in which environment is stronger than will. Not that will isn't important. Will is clearly important, but we already know that. So we must explore what we don't know, which is outside of one's will. What are you powerless over? What can you think in your life that you literally have no power, no choice, no well, control over? And that should start bringing you down the tunnel of fear. And it is through the tunnel of fear where you gain wisdom, supposedly, right? Well, isn't that isn't part of one of the things, I mean, I know it's one of the things I enjoy about, you know, jiu-jitsu. Sometimes I just love the chaos of the fight, right? You know, it's, yes. it's always changing, always evolving. And when you sort of hamper it, right, and you, you take away the chaos of it, it sort of almost becomes less enjoyable when you're fighting, you know, if that yes. makes sense, like with rules. It's but kind of like, I, you know, I say, um, 20 years ago, I'm in what, Thailand, and there's one of those places, and my wife and I were in, in a cab with some locals, and I just paid him 100 bucks, and they, we hung around him and his wife all day and ate at their house, and we're having this great time. And we're driving past, we keep driving past this, uh, you, you know, big bungee jump. And I'm like, oh, I got to go bungee jump. Yeah, this will be great. So we roll over there. And of course, I'm the only guy there. So I look up at this huge crane and tower and stuff. And it's like, yeah, that looks pretty high. That looks a little scary. And But the guys there, cool guys, making all these jokes. You know, like, I don't know if the rubber band is going to, oh, this one might break. And, you know, but they have an old one hanging on the wall that's all frayed. And the guy <laughs> but to grab that one. And I'm like, um, you know, it's this whole thing. And it was all pretty funny until we start going up. Then the jokes stop being a little funny. I'm getting a little nervous, right? I'm like at that 25 feet thing. Well, at least I'll live. I'll bust an ankle. And that's going to be a hard a PLF right there and then we're moving up I'm like there's no PLF that could save me after this one right I've been to jump school I'm not scared I've done this but here's the thing in the jump school or sky diving you trust the equipment you've seen other humans do this ahead of you but when you're the first one, which is how it felt. <laughs> and the only one. <laughs> and the only one. How do I trust the equipment? So there I am. Boom. I'm at the top now. And that little lake looks like a postage stamp. And I know that would feel like a concrete and I will die. If this equipment fails, I die. So I am totally reliant on these guys and the equipment. I let myself fall. I don't jump. I couldn't really make a choice. What I could do is just lean forward and let myself fall. And even though, yes, we're talking about 99% chance these guys aren't gonna stick a bad rubber band on there and all that stuff. All the odds are good, but our human brains will take that 0.5%, that 1%, and that becomes the focus. Whoosh. So, if anything, so we, mm -hmm. these are the things in life 
It's the same thing that you're in a bar, you've had a few but drinks, the guy down the way is talking some shit and you're talking shit, you're evaluating each other, should we have this thing? You are having a sport a combat athlete experience when you are having a bar. You are basically, yes, it's not sanctioned by the state, but it is a sport. There are cultural rules. You are having a duel. You are dueling. You are in somewhat gauging the control as the brawl gets closer and closer to where you're going to exchange. Now, you go blindly into the brackets, you lose that control. You actually have less control over who you fight when you sign up for the Joe's backyard grapple off than you do when you are choosing and gauging who you match up with in a bar. Do you think, I mean, one of the things you're pointing out, right, it's it's almost human nature. Like, I mean, people have been grappling since the beginning of people, you know, pretty yeah. much, right? Or, yeah. or fighting, right? So, wrestling. Yeah. And, and so it, it just sort of seems like it's so much in human nature, like this whole thing that we're sort of analyzing and talking about now is just, it's it's almost human nature at its, at its purest in some ways. Yes. Yes. And that is, is it's like, People often say all the time, like, but jujitsu will make you a better a person. I think that's generally true, but there's a lot of jerks who get a black belts and continue, but to be jerks. And we have all been the jerk before. We have all. And I would say that if you have assholeism, but jujitsu will not cure it, but you might not be as bad of an asshole, but you'll still be an asshole. <laughs> and speaking of that, that is one of your more famous clips on Instagram that we did share from a speech that you gave and i'd like to get a quote an exact direct quote from you on the show and it was something to the effect i wish i would have brought it up before the show but so we can bring it up and we'll actually bring it up yeah, we'll, uh, we'll edit it in but it's a, a a snippet of you i think it was i don't know if it was at a globe trotters but you were on the mat and you were saying if you can't identify identify in the room who the asshole is you are most likely the asshole yeah it's, it's like when you're running around and everybody's an asshole pissing you off all the time, you're probably the asshole, I think is what I said. Yeah. You know, yeah. And yeah, that's, and it's really easy to spot the asshole out there. And if that becomes your there's your focus, you're going to start reacting asshole-ish to the assholes. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, Chris. I, don't I, know. I, think you should, I think you should make an asshole patch that we could actually give to the assholes to add on to their game. <laughs> Easy to spot. <laughs> well, that's the other thing is, is we also don't want to become – Mr. Morals, right? Mm -hmm. Because that then you th th that a person also, which you see manifested in right wing religious culture and left wing cancel culture, is running around trying but to regulate morality is a slippery slope as well. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. That's 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 huge. I wanted to jump in before you jump in. Yeah, it's 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 huge. Um, on my mind, I had one more question to head back before I forget on the topics of uh, 
you know, the rule sets and, you know, certain governing bodies. And then I love the vision of the Globetrotters. I mean, once I opened the academy out here and I saw what the Globetrotters were doing, you know, travel friendly jujitsu, not having this team flag up and where you walk in and then it's like, you don't know what you're going to get when you walk into an open mat. Oh, this guy fights at this school. Let's, let's fight him and let's make sure we show what we know is the best and beat this guy up. And that whole mentality is not what's going to grow the sport. And when I saw Globetrotters doing their thing and it's like travel friendly, they're doing these worldwide camps. Uh, it doesn't matter your, your rank or your style you know, um, it's just kind of, that's, that type of thing is going to grow the sport. And I think we've seen lately some kind of pushback with that mentality versus the existing governing bodies. What's your thoughts on that? Well, Well, it, 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 again, it, it kind of reminds me of watching Amazon, but Google and Apple, try to explain and rationalize to a Congress why they should be the ones controlling media content, right? I mean, it's, that is the age old human story. From the time where the two cousins split apart in hunting tribes and one bred with the Neanderthals and suddenly we had blood against blood combat, right? I, I mean, that's, it, it's as old as human history. And um, we could end this on the note that one could say as humbly as we can with our limited little meet the computers <laughs> that that might be why we don't experience other off-world alien life because life might just evolve to a point where it kills itself because we culturally t t t evolve faster than we do and technologically outpace nature and basically as the tom waits said we are monkeys with language and guns and now we're monkeys with nuclear bombs and ai yeah that's and, that's a good point <laughs> you know and we pick people to lead us based on popularity of contests rather than qualifications. And I think that is a dangerous, dangerous thing that we, we as humans ac across ideologies are playing. I think w w what frightens the shit out of me, and I include me in this, is I can choose, I can instantly have an image in my brain, a feeling, and I could name them of some of the greatest combat athletes in the world. But can you name who cured a polio? But can you name who created the smallpox vaccine? Can you express why Albert Einstein's theories revolutionized science, which have far more of an impact on us than who was the greatest heavyweight in the world. Yet we are primarily wired to where that's what's important, who is popular, and who can beat up who? That is our primal wiring. Who is more popular and who can beat up who? So, so when we finally find alien life, is it going to be robotic? What do you think, Chris? It's going There's to be, a good chance it's going to be non-organic. Non organic. out there 
made it a little bit beyond us and somehow created an AI that can self perpetuate. And there's some object that seems weird out there or an object that's completely masked that we just haven't, yes, who knows? Or, yeah. or maybe we create that AI and that AI based on programming itself decides that it needs to adjust our biological evolution and does so. Who the fuck knows? <laughs> well, that's it. We're, we're going to go into that topic right now. This is awesome. I mean, this is a jiu-jitsu podcast, but we, we could talk about anything. On that subject, there's like this uh, government report that is came out and they can't i they legitimately admit that they can't identify certain things that are out there verified by the military these 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 unidentified objects and you know they were suspecting it was secret us technology is it is it foreign technology is it alien and now they admit that it's not ours but they can't confirm that it's not foreign but the techno technology there's no propulsion there's no no right. sign of right. any of that stuff. <laughs> we totally took a twist on this. We're thing. on Joe Rogan uh, yeah, territory we, we, we. here now. All right. Let's wear our skeptic hats. Yep. Okay. And let's keep handy in our other hand our tinfoil hats as well. Mm -hmm. Got mine right under here. My <laughs> skeptic hat says this. I believe that the Area 51 alien crash was a highly compartmentalized CIA operation, compartmentalized to a point where maybe five guys knew it, and they tricked other Americans of high level to believe this in order to convince the Russians in the Cold War that we had alien technology. And I almost see it as that's probably that that's what my skeptical hat says is happening we trick our navy pilots so they report it so it creates a confusion within our enemies yeah now, that's that makes perfect sense to me <laughs> because the russians and chinese have hacked everything and we have hacked everything so in order to create anything to remain secret it has to be so compartmentalized which is the same way the uber rich keep their money it is in a shell book corporation hidden by an llc protected by an army of lawyers that protect it from another army of lawyers that that put it all in an llc in the cayman islands and are you going to ever crack that nut? Yeah, probably, probably not. not. Probably now, not. Yep. That's my skeptic hat. It also means why do these aliens only present themselves on small screens to Navy pilots? Why do these aliens only appear where military operations are happening? Why aren't these aliens con attacking the New York Times. <laughs> so that's again my skeptic hat. Now my tin foil hat, let's stick on that. My tin foil hat says, okay, my Gene Roddenberry style approach says the aliens just watched America over the last four years and say this is the leadership of the world what a bunch of fucking idiots they should yeah. be paying attention to the smart people but no the masses pay attention to the mass bullshit now i do too i enjoy the mass shit i like to be entertained right we all love being entertained. That's why we all stare at our screens all day long. Because we like to be distracted and entertained. 
Now, if I were an alien enemy, I would continue to distract us and entertain us, <laughs> which is, of course, why it gives rise to all the various sci-fi theories, conspiracy theories. Again, right now, I'm wearing the Tim foil hat, right? It's all a mass distraction campaign and all that. And if you follow that thread long enough, you realize that it too is absurd. And what we really are, there is no grand unified conspiracy. There is no single individualized group of multinational running everything but what there is is a bunch of powerful people who meet before they testify to Congress to say how do we keep this racket going because we're making a ton of fucking money and I promise you there is almost not a person out there whether it was CNN Fox News MSNBC, no matter what your ideology is, that said, hey, we're going to give you fame and a big fat but check so you can appear on our channel and be a pundit. You can be the punching bag for our hosts. Mm. We're going to do it. Because we are monkeys with language and guns running around trying to complete our three primal functions, the three F's, feeding, fighting, and ucking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, couldn't have said it better. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, with that's, that, that's I a... think I'm done. <laughs> well, well, Chris, thank you for joining us today, man. Where can everyone find more about you? Where can they find out about your awesome artwork and everything you're doing? Combatbase.com. Now, I will say that like most artists, I'm flaky as fuck. <laughs> and like most artists, my opinion frequently changes. So don't hold me but to any opinion I have said. And I probably also often agree with the exact opposite of what I said, depending on the mood in which you catch me. And to find CombatBase.com, you pick up one of these computer thingies that all these young kids are doing, <laughs> and you put in www. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> Remember but that old joke, right? I'm trying to actually find a little video that I could show you guys. Yeah, you can I send that directly to us, and we're going to put that right in the show. All right. I will send you guys. I'll send you guys. Send, send us that and we'll, we'll yeah send us it. that and what's we'll what's the it. uh what's the show us that uh if you can i don't know the artwork got on the back can we get that on combat uh based on where the artwork that's right behind you is that is an original one-off so wow it's awesome weird, you know what's weird is, is the a camera on the ipad i think that fucking apple changed their camera location to spy on me more <laughs> <laughs> There you go. Wow. Let's see if I can walk it in. Yeah, so this piece of art basically represents going through the ranks. You can see the white belt tape below. See, these are layers, and then you, you enter the world. Here's not knowing any grappling at all. Here's where... You have no learned knowledge, but primal grappling skills, which is why often the biggest pain in the ass isn't what the blue belt, it's that white belt water polo 
a guy who who just can twist his arms in all these weird ways, right? And then you mm-hmm. become a white belt. You enter the gray area. The blue, you're working yourself up to purple belt. After a while, black belt. The spinning, don't go down that little tunnel. You know, and then, yeah, it's... <laughs> That's great. The white corner, the black will corner the contrast, and that's what you're looking at. All right. So awesome. you guys send me an email or a text so I yep. can email yep. you. And for everybody, um, for everybody out there, your your Instagram is Chris Howder Art. Is that correct? Chris Howder Art is my personal Instagram. Instagram, okay. Then Combat Base USA, I think, is my other one. And then there's Combat Base Texas, Combat Base. There's other ones, right? But, um, yeah. And then my wife is kind of the one that runs most of our Instagram accounts. I'm really bad at that social media thing um, because I actually fucking hate social media. (laughs) Right? It's been the blessing and the curse. Mm-hmm. It's a yeah. blessing yeah, and- at first, like everything, right? It's yeah, it's yeah. Before before we leave, I'd, I'd like to get you a little bit uh, to just tell all the listeners out there that are training jujitsu. You know, we could we could talk all day about the politics of belt promotion, belts. You know, where the the, the, the rule sets are and all of that. But the question is, where do we go from here? And what should everybody in the jujitsu practitioner's mindset should be? What What do you think as far as continuing and growing the sport? Well, I would say approach every class fresh and new, relaxed, and open, ready to learn new knowledge. And I think if you practice the art of learning, you will get, you will not only improve your jujitsu faster, but you will improve your life and your community's life, your nation's life, and hopefully the world's life. And then maybe the aliens will want to contact us. <laughs> All right, guys. Chris, thank you so awesome. much, man. Right. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. We'll talk to you soon. Come on, Professor. You mean like how you... Come on! Blink.